the principle of the matter is, is the Lord showed this to me and, oh man, it's changed my world that open hearts, open hearts, open hearts, open hearts. Jesus said that you're able to love me because I loved you. We cannot know what love is because love, God is love until he opens up his heart and is like, I'm going to open this up to you. And if you see this, if you are able to perceive this, then your heart will just whew, wide open. Surrendering to the Lord. I believe that humanity is on a journey of surrendering and opening our heart to the Lord. And it has to do not with the Lord because he's already he's like, while we were still sinners, Christ filleted himself open for us. And he hung there. God, as a man, hung there, uncovered, said, my heart is open. And when we see, when we look at him, our heart opens. And we get to see where we came from. We originated. Our origin is in him. From the father, from his breath, he came. And he breathed in us. We came from him. And our destination is back to him. But yet because we're like him, he's given us total freedom. And so he says, hey, my heart is so open to you. Will you marry me? Will you come into me? Will, I want to know you. God the creator wants to know the created. <sighs> Will you open up your heart to me? And if you do, then <laughs> come in. Because you came from me and you belong in me. But because I'm free, I made you free. And so I'm going to propose to you, but I'm going to leave it to you, right? The journey of humanity is responding to the filleted heart of God and saying, come back to me. I love you, so I set you free. Come back to me. So good. Thank you, Jesus. I feel, I feel home in this place. I just want to say that there's a holy jealousy in me that when I'm, I, I met Pastor Tim on, on, on Thursday, and I knew nothing. I didn't know the name of the church. I didn't know where I was speaking. I didn't know that that was your pastor. I just met him, and he opened up his heart. I mean, he, he doesn't know me from anyone. I mean, t 10 minutes on YouTube, talking about a pretty controversial topic, you know? <laughs> and, and it's amazing that what the Lord can do in a moment where it's like he opened up his heart to me, and I was just like, I love this man. And I open up my heart to him. And, and we have the same DNA. And we have the same Lord. And I'm just like, and I, I'm staying with friends that are here in town. And they're amazing. And I'm like, guys, like, I have no idea what this church is or who's there or what it is. But like, if I lived in Lexington, this would be my home church. I said that to them. I'm like, I've yet to meet like the family that I'm going to see. But like, if, if this was my home, like, this is this is this would be my home because of the uh, of what your mom and dad and the Lord carry, you know, whether they're younger or older than you. What they carry and what even the generation before carries, it's just like it's Jesus. When I'm here, I see Jesus, I hear Jesus, I feel Jesus, and He's here, and and it's it's so amazing. And so sometimes as an outsider. Like you come in and so you're just open to anything and you just like honor for someone for who they are. You see them by the spirit and you honor them. But then I also realized that there's something that when you're here and you're around someone and you get familiar, sometimes the, when you look at gold enough, you get desensitized to how valuable it is. And so I just want to reaffirm that you are in the right place and there is so much gold here. And that as you release honor, that your heart will be so opened and you'll receive directly from the Lord. Because this couple isn't giving you themselves, they're giving you the Lord. They're just like, he's in me and I want to let him out. Because God doesn't dwell in temples built by human hands. He left that box a long time ago. He had to fit in a box because they didn't know how to fit him anywhere else. But he left that box and he doesn't dwell in temples built by human hands. No, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit who we have from God and he dwells in us. And so when we open up our heart, 
people see the Lord. And, and, and that's what's in this place. That's what's in your pastors. And so here's Dawn, sweet Dawn, just leading worship. And then just like, there's that moment where it's like, we all felt the shift. It was like, whew. the heart went wide open. It was like, wow, I, the Lord is here. Because <laughs> like, we can give our gift. We can give our song. We can give our revelation. We can give our tongue. But it's not that that transforms. None of that changes you. Heart that changes us, not what happens on our head. Can I tell you that the greatest enemy of you having intimacy is this intellectualism? <laughs> the greatest enemy to intimacy is between your ears because <laughs> we're not created to live with this experience, this questioning, striving trying to understand but we're actually designed to and then we get it by the spirit jesus speaking of the holy spirit and john said that when the holy spirit comes he's speaking of the holy spirit he says he will create a river in you and out of your belly out of your innermost being out of your the center of who you are will flow rivers of living water if, if, if you ever have a hard time, like ministering to someone, can I tell you the only reason why you're stuck is because you're trying to minister from your mind instead of from your heart. If you ever feel stuck in your relationship with the Lord, I guarantee you the problem is right here. It's in your soul. Because God is not looking for those that are going to worship him in body and in soul. He's looking for those that will worship him in spirit. And in truth, because God is spirit, and he's looking for those. Us in his image and likeness, we are tripartite. We are spirit, soul, and body. And I think sometimes when we get stuck, it's because we try to love the Lord our God, which, and we get scriptures for this, and we get stuck based on scripture, guys, I'm telling you. I actually said this in one of my sessions, I don't remember which one it was, I know you're in one of them, but I think I realized this, that, now, let me preface this, that I am a man that loves scripture like crazy, I've given my whole life to it, I'm 36 years old, at 12 years old, the Lord spoke to me and said, study my word, because I'm going to use you to preach and teach the word of God. At 12 years old, I had an encounter with God, and it was the first time I opened up my Bible to actually study and it's taken me years to figure out how to do it correctly because at first it was a bunch of intellectualism so I made sure to go to like a good Christian university and get as much theology as I could and read in t a ton of books and and study things and get into the Greek and the geek and the freak and all that you know <laughs> I made sure to baptize myself in that stuff and it was crazy because only only like <laughs> I go off to a spirit-filled Christian AG university and that's where I lose my connection and intimacy with the Lord after just a year of baptiz baptizing myself in theology. And for a year and a half, I'm way too prideful to like stop going to church because I was raised in a church. And my dad was a minister and a pastor and a teacher. And so I grew up going five plus times a week to church. And so I knew that like one thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to forsake the assembling of the gathering of ourselves together. And I, and I was in a really amazing church. Incredible. But I so baptized myself in intellectual theological pursuits that I started to question everything. I went to college and all of a sudden I started figuring out like, wait, wait, wait. All the picture that I painted for myself for like what this was started to get challenged because all of a sudden these intellects and start to break down texts and translations and manuscripts and things and that I'm just like I just thought it was simple and actually it is but sometimes the very th from him Okay, don't get me wrong, like, I've given my life to the study of Scripture because it's an arrow that points to Him, but it's not until I started coming back to Him that my life started getting changed. It's when my heart opens up to Him that He changes me, not when my mind opens up to the Scripture. I love this. I mean, I'm a Bible teacher. I, I give my life to using 
only scripture in context without twisting it, without mangling it to set people free with truth. I have limited like what, what, I, what I speak from based simply on scripture. So I honor this so much. But what I realized is that the very thing that used to actually distance us from God. Let, let me explain and give you a couple examples because speak to your mind and plant things to your soul to create a barrier between you and God because our communion with God is by the spirit only. God is spirit. I'm just quoting scripture. And he's longing for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah, Vic, but doesn't it say like, love the Lord God with all your heart and mind and soul? And it's like, wait, why, why are we using like almost like the same word? I mean, the same thing for a bunch of different things. Like, aren't we supposed to love God with our body and soul and spirit? Yes. But true worship is when it's in the spirit and then the fruit happens in backwards, you'll never get to the spirit. You can start with worship in the body and never connect with him in spirit. You can dance and shout and do backflips until you're sweating and you break your leg. And, and you might never have a connection with him. Because the key to the connection is not what happened in your body. And it's not what happened in your soul, your emotions. You can get overwhelmed with emotion. Have you ever seen a Disney movie and cried? I have a lot of them. Why? It stirs your emotion. And you're like... The, the thing you're experiencing in your emotion actually is the exact same thing that you experience in the presence of God because it's the same faculties that it comes through. Some people like, you go to like a show or a concert and they gear it with lights and music and emotion and the way they gear it, it's like scientifically geared to stir up emotion and people are like, oh. same channel that God uses, that the enemy uses, that the flesh uses to stir it up. And so sometimes we can actually by the spirit, the real part of us is spirit. That's the part that we have from God, that God never have connection with the Lord. You can actually learn the principles of the kingdom because they're actually available not just to believers but to actually unbelievers. You, unbelievers can learn the principles of God and actually do things like heal the sick, like prophesy, like cast out demons and miracles. That might be challenging to you, but Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Matthew 7, You, I did this in your name, I did this in your name, prophesied, miracles, cast out demons. I mean, that's pretty big stuff. I never, that's not like you walked away. I never gnosko you, knew you, which is like an intimate encounter, connection by the Spirit. No, he didn't use the word for, because there's two words for knowledge in Scripture. There's gnosis, intellect, knowledge. It's not that I didn't know you because he knows us. And he knows the hairs on our head. He created us. He gnosis everyone, but he doesn't gnosko everyone. Gnosko is the word for the, 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 the Jew. Connection between a husband and a wife that would produce a new life. You learned how to do my. I don't have any gnosko with you. Our spirits are not one. In Corinthians, it says this, whoever joins himself to the Lord has become one spirit with God. We will become because when the glory shows up, these unglorified bodies hit the floor because they can't stand in the glory. But the glorified body, yay, we can stand in the throne room and we don't have to hit the floor anymore. We can actually continue to have in the body and the soul. Because like when our bodies hit the floor and our spirits having communion, sometimes we can't necessarily feel it and we don't even know it because it's only perceived by the spirit.
It's foolishness to those who are perishing that are still of the flesh. But our communion with the Lord is by the You can be a Do the physical, because, I mean, you go to different parts of the world. I was here at School of Reform, and it's amazing. Like, I'm around a, a group of people that is, like, different than me, and I'm just like, man, I love how they worship. Like, ah, oh, this is amazing. But you can get caught up in even the physical expression of something, but never have a connection with God. Because your connection with God is not what happens in your body, and it's actually not what happens in your soul. It's about opening your heart. And when we use the word heart, we're not talking about a physical faculty or we're not even talking about the soul realm. We're talking about your innermost being. The Bible calls heart or the word cardia and it refers to that sometimes as the soul, but oftentimes as the core of you, the real you, the spirit, the, the most inner being. I mean, some translations call it the belly because it's like, but again, it's, it, it, it's, it's not physically belly. It's uh, an expression of the most inner part of you because there's three parts of you. The body, the shell, which is going to be made new, glorification. The soul, which is being renewed day by day by the renewing of your mind. And that's where all of us get stuck. Every believer, if you're ever stuck, communing with the Lord or releasing the Lord in power, the only problem is an unrenewed mind. Unbelief only happens in the soul. And that's the part that gets every single person stuck. So if you're ever stuck, the problem is in the soul. Because in the spirit, we're already one with God. We're joined to God. We're one with him. You have become one spirit with God. Whoever joins himself to the Lord has become one spirit with God. I think... Someone Google that passage real quick. I want, to, I want to get the address to just give that to you. I have it in my notes somewhere, but I don't want to scroll. Say it again. Whoever joins himself to the Lord. Just type in whoever joins himself to the Lord verse. Boom, it'll pop up right away. I think it's 2 Corinthians. What is it? Okay. 1 Corinthians what? 6, 19, 17? 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Throw it on the address so you can go back to that cul-de-sac and think about it. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Whoever joins himself to the Lord has become one spirit with God. I love it. The person who is joined to this is one spirit with him. That's the NLT. You can do ESV, NASB. I don't know any of those, whatever. But if you guys have another translation, it's awesome. I love NLT, actually. I read it for many, many years. Whoever joins himself to the Lord has become one spirit with God. I felt like the Lord wanted to just release this. And so sometimes I'm like, a lot of thoughts will come and I'll try to release them. I'm, I'm a little bit like your pastor. I'm a verbal processor. <laughs> and so you have to have grace for your pastor. Otherwise, if you start to not have grace for him, you'll start receiving from him. And he's pure gold. Have grace for him as he sometimes like maybe might be long-winded or verbally processes things. But if you honor it and you receive those little nuggets, they'll change your life. But the moment you kind of get agitated, irritated, like I'm tired of an hour and 15 minute messages. Can we please just like bring it down? What will happen is you'll stop receiving because honor is the only thing that can receive. Honor has a reward called a funnel that receives from. The moment you get critical is the second that you'll stop receiving. If you've stopped drinking of the deep well of God that's in your pastors, there's only one problem. You got critical. Because you're different and you're wired differently and you're not seeing it from his lens and his perspective. And so you get critical because there's, he processes it differently than you. And maybe like he just said the word and you already got the revelation, but he's still walking through it. But when you get critical, you, you, you close off the funnel. Right? And so... Part of how the body works is it only works, you'll only be fed by what you honor. Whatever you criticize, no matter how incredible it is, you will receive nothing. And sometimes what's crazy is that we so don't give grace to people that they could actually be speaking truth like 99.99% of the time. And they'll just say one thing that rubs you the wrong way. And you're like, that's hairy, see? 
and then you just cut off and you never heard anything else they said. And it's like, here is, here is the Lord that you can drink from, but you cut off yourself from the Lord because of one thing that you don't see because it seems hairy to you. I hope you got the pun. It's just not very punny. So what's amazing is you can actually, like, it's amazing. Like, I came here and your pastor said, like, I trust you. And I opened up my heart to you. And he's like, because of that, like, our whole community is. And it's, it's a spiritual thing. Like, you guys don't know that. But you guys, your hearts are open, actually, because his heart's open towards me. And he doesn't know, like, what I bring. He doesn't know, like, if I'm going to teach some kind of crazy, weird stuff. Like, as a teacher that just teaches a lot of stuff, you know, and goes after kind of like what, what, like, to wreck things that are wrong, to, like, set a foundation for what's right. Like, he doesn't know. But, but you know what's amazing is that because he's so intimate with the Lord, he's like, I'm just going to receive of the Lord. And whatever's not of the Lord, I'm going to give grace to because we all still have this, like, layer around us called, like, sarks as long as we live on this earth. That we're not supposed to live by sarks, flesh. But we're supposed to actually live by the Spirit so we never fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because the flesh is around us. It's not in us. It's around us. It's not our identity, but it surrounds us. Because it's almost like we live in this bubble called this world that's still like being renewed because the sons of God are eagerly... I mean, the, the earth is groaning for the manifestation of sons of God to restore it. But because it's not restored yet, we live in this world that's still broken. And so it's like we're, we're encapsulated by this thing called Sark's flesh. And it's not the real us. It's not in us. The lie you believe is that you think it's in you trying to come out of you. Right. That will keep you stuck. But if you realize this is not in me, this is just around me, and I never have to yield to this because I'm going to live by the Spirit, so I'll never fulfill the desires of the outer circle, flesh, all of a sudden we're free. Because yeah. we realize, like, wait, my identity is not wrapped up in this realm or this realm. It's the most innermost part of me. Who I am by the Spirit is who I really am. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5.16... Paul says, we no longer evaluate anyone according to the sarks, flesh. The original word for flesh is sarks. That's why I say that. So a little bit of geek in, in there. Yeah. Thank you for permission. So he said, we now recognize no one according to the flesh because it's not really them. Quit connecting someone's behavior to their identity. Otherwise, you'll never be able to see who they really are. And you'll keep calling them by what they did instead of by who they are. And whatever you speak to will grow. So when you speak to someone's behavior, they think that's their identity, so that will grow. So when my daughter is misbehaving, I realize that that's not actually who she really is. So instead of speaking to the behavior, I speak to the identity because if she can believe right, she'll behave right without any effort. Because whatever you believe, you will behave literally without effort. I'll prove it to you like this. None of you have ever gone to the best coffee shop in this whole entire town called Brevity. Anyone ever been to Brevity Coffee? Okay, a couple of you. You guys check it out. It's like five minutes away from here. Best coffee shop in town. The owners love the Lord. They open up their doors to Bible studies. The Lord, they have scripture written on their wall. They're spirit filled. They're amazing. Best coffee shop in town. And they're like, hey, if you guys want to do Bible studies here, wide open. So do community there. It's amazing. Club Brevity Coffee. Anyways, they're right here. Can you guys stand up? You guys, they hosted me this weekend. And they are like scientifically amazing with coffee. So amaz you guys are amazing. This is Nick and Viarica. And uh, they hosted uh, me while I was here. Uh, we are connected through marriage. My sister married Nick's brother. So we're like wow. all connected. So it's awesome. But they, they've opened it up and they are hosting the kingdom of God. It's like an, a door for someone to go from like not knowing the Lord to they'll go to a coffee shop before they'll come to destiny. Right? But it's like, man. Like, we need those, like, doors to bring someone into the house, you know? And so that's what these guys are. It's incredible. But check this out. Back to this. But 
you never go into a coffee shop. I don't think anyone's ever done this. I can safely assume this. And, and raise your hand and correct me if I'm wrong. And like you come up to the register and you're like, hey, I really need $10,000. Please give it to me. No one's ever done that. I'll prove to you why. You've done that? $10,000? It's amazing. You got the, whether you got the money or not, but you've asked, that's amazing. You've got some great faith, young lady. It's an honor to know you. You're the first one I ever met. But the, why do we not have like accountability groups? Like, hold me back. Like, my name's Vic and, you know, I'm addicted to $10,000 askings. Like, hold me. Like, just, just every Starbucks is, I've been into, they're like, please give me $10,000. No one's having accountability, prayer groups, fasting groups, and like deliverance ministry to, to prevent you from asking any institution that's a, that's a finance or store for $10,000. Why? Because number one, you probably don't even believe these days that they even have $10,000 in that register, which they don't. That's like they don't do that. So you don't believe it. And number two, if they did, you don't believe that they would hand it over to you unless you threaten their life with a gun, you know? But you wouldn't just go in there and ask because you don't believe that it's possible, so you're not behaving that way because your behavior is connected to your belief system. So no one's ever tempted to go ask Starbucks for $10,000 because you don't believe it. So there's zero temptation connected to it. So everything that temptation is connected to it's actually connected to a lie you're believing in the sarks so you never actually have a behavior problem you only have a belief problem okay you never have a behavior problem you only have an unrenewed mind problem because God does salvation in three parts. He's finished it in the spirit. We call that justified. I look like him. It's just as if I never sinned. Finished. The finished work of Jesus is where? In the spirit. But now we're being renewed day by day in the knowledge of him. Be transformed, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world. Why is he telling Christians that? Because I thought Christians were already transformed. Uh-huh. But be transformed. Wait, so which one is it? I was transformed or I'm being transformed? Uh-huh. Wait, wait, wait. I don't get it. So is it A or B? Yes. Hmm. But what you're saying is I'm all schizophrenic and disconnected. No, no, no. You just don't understand. You're actually just like the Lord. You are tripartite. And you can live by the Spirit or you can and, and never fulfill the desires of what's not really you. Or you can live by something that's actually not you because your mind is unrenewed. Because that is the part that it says, Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed but be transformed, metamorphosis, by the changing of the way you think, by the renewing of your mind. So we've been saved, justified, and in the spirit, we look identical to Jesus in every way. Whoever's been joined to Christ has become one spirit with God. And the Lord will never be unequally yoked. So he'll only be yoked to you when you're perfect just like him. So in the spirit, you look like Jesus in every way. Why is that not manifesting to the soul and the body? There's only one problem. The valve is closed with our unrenewed mind. So we will look like Jesus when we actually believe Christ is in us and we've already been dead to sin and alive to God. But when we still think that there's a struggle and it's in us, like the lie of Romans 7, that, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? It's still in me. I'm stuck. And we take scripture, which was my original point, and then we become deceived, and then we don't manifest Jesus, which is really who we are. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in us. He doesn't dwell in temples built by human hands. He's not like in this building in one sense. He's in this building. <laughs> Oftentimes, like, we talk about ministry to the Lord, and I love it. To me, I think all of life is about ministry to the Lord. But sometimes we only see ministry to the Lord like this. Or actually, it's like more like this. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about 
Christ in me. I'm not thinking about me because I already died. <laughs> I've been crucified with Christ, so how can I think about something that's already dead? I don't. I think about Christ in me. So sometimes like, sometimes we like try to press into the heavenlies. It's like, mm, let's tarry for the heavenlies. It's like, you don't have to tarry for the heavenlies. They're in you. <laughs> Christ in you. The kingdom of God is within you. When Jesus was talking, he said it's at hand because the Holy Spirit hadn't come and whew, given breath back to man. But what's the first thing Jesus did after he's resurrected? Literally, the very first thing that he did, it says the same day that he resurrected. You can read it in John 20, Luke 24. The very same day he resurrected, he comes, appears behind closed doors to the disciples. The first thing that he tells his disciples, the first thing that he does, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathes on them in John 20, Luke 24, parallel passage. It paints the whole picture of what happens. Incredible. And then he also says, now wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Wait, wait, wait. You just breathed and the Holy Spirit's in them, but now they need the Holy Spirit upon them. Two different experiences. There's four positions of the Holy Spirit. With you, anyone that's a non-believer, to convict the world of sin, which is unbelief. He's with everyone. He's in you when you're like, I hope in my heart, come into me. Then he can come upon you, baptize with power, authority, where heaven now is on earth through you, the baptism, and then there's like the continual filling. It says that the disciples continually were filled with the Spirit. And these were ones that were already baptized in the Spirit. Yeah. Continual in filling. It's like we were talking about today. It's like we already have him, but we want more. A.W. Tozer says it like this, that the greatest paradox of love is that even though I have him, I seek him more. I have him, but I want him. The greatest paradox of love. Yes, I have my wife. I'm married to her 13 years. But like our honeymoon, that didn't satisfy me for the rest of my life. I want more. I want dates. I want to I wanna know her. I want to be around her. I'm looking at like, you know, I'm here for four days. And so I'm looking at her Instagram. I'm looking at pictures. I'm like, I love you. I want to be around you. It's like you have her. You have, you're in covenant. You can have as much as you want, but you want more. Because love isn't satisfied in one sense. Love, there's an endless depth of love. If you're afraid of eternity because you're like, what in the world are we going to be doing? You don't even know love. <laughs> because when you start to fall in love and you open up your heart more, you realize it's actually endless. It's literally endless. There's no end to God. It's an endless amount of experiences and encounters that you want more and more of. Yes, I, I have my daughters and my son and I have my wife, but I want to be around them more. I want another experience. I want another encounter. I want another, oh, it's, I, I, it's, it's like I'm, not, I'm, I'm no longer looking for information. I'm looking for another encounter. Because it's like I already know all the information about you. Like, and so it's like sometimes when we catch up, like how was your day? It's like can we get past the information so we can have like a deeper like heart-to-heart -heart encounter? It's because like, like that's what you're longing for. Like we're not created to have that surfacey informational conversation. We're created to open up our heart and spirit and soul. It's like, yeah. We're created relationally, not informationally. Sometimes we think like, oh yeah, I know Donald Trump. I've read his biography. No, no, no. That's gnosis. That will never produce. Like I could read the biography about my wife, but that'll never give new life. Sometimes we read about the biography of our creator, but we never have new life. We're educated in the biography, but we actually don't have life in us. Because to have life in us, you have to connect yourself to him in life. It's like that intimate exchange. I mean, like God created all of like humanity and the relationships we have on earth and husband and wife and sexuality. Why? It's all an image of what we can have with God. Yes. Why did God design it that way? Like it's so intricately deep. I don't want to get graphic because there's like all kinds of ages here, but it's like seed comes and implants and creates new life. Yes. And he says, I am life. Unless you eat of me, unless I come into you, then you have no life in me. It's not about what you heard. It's like, no, you must eat of me and I must be in you. Otherwise, there's no life in you. This is eternal life that you, they may gnosko me. That's what Jesus said. 
not that they may know about me. Eternal life is not about the information that you know, because otherwise the person that would have the most eternal life would be the devil. Has more information about the Godhead than all of us combined, probably. Was around way before all of us and has watched the Godhead operate for a long time. Has the scriptures memorized that when he quoted them to Jesus, he didn't misquote them. The deception of the devil wasn't in the misquoting of scripture. It was in the twisting of the heart of what it actually meant. And that's what he tried to do from the beginning. With Adam and Eve, did God really say? He quoted God accurately. He just was like, did he really mean that when he said that? Or did he mean this? And he'll plant deception, not by violating the letter. Your exit Jesus could be perfect and you could be deceived and not know him. It's the letter kills. What? I'm not against the letter. I'm just not eating the letter. I'm eating the word, which is him. There's Jesus separates the letter from the word. Ah, let me just introduce something controversial to you that I want you to explore. Get your own revelation on this. But the scripture never refers to the letter as the word of God. It only refers to the person as the word of God. Whoa. I'm discovering that one. That was like a new thought that like hit me like three weeks ago. And I was like, that's hairy, you see. I have to, I have to really dig into that one. And then I was like, is that really true? I started exploring. It's like, no, no. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word came through a woman and became flesh. But now people believe the lie that women cannot deliver the word anymore. Uh, well, God thought it'd be cool to deliver the first word through a woman. <laughs> Uh oh, God must have not got the memo of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 when he did that. Whoops. So, what does the enemy do? He'll take a quotation and he will exegete it for you perfectly to deceive you. He did that in Genesis, he did that with Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord. I'm introducing a lot of thoughts that you're going to have to chew on. I'm not giving you like a super soft, like juicy filet mignon that melts in your mouth. I'm giving you one that's like bubble gum that you're going to have to chew for a while. <laughs> because if, you know, if, if I softened it too much for you, you just swallow it, it would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't feel it. But if you have to chew on it for a while, it goes from information to revelation to transformation. Help us, Lord. So we can partake of the letter perfectly and miss him completely. Now, that doesn't mean I throw this aside. It's just that when I open it, I'm actually eating him. Now, again, I'm using figurative language, the same ones Jesus used. So, I mean, that offended people, so it might offend people now. I mean, all of his disciples almost left. And he turns to the 12, are you going to leave too? And they didn't say no. They just said, we don't know where to go. Like, we don't have anywhere else to sleep. They weren't like, no, Jesus, that offends us, but we really like you. We're sticking with you. They're just like, so they're contemplating going. They just don't know where to go, so they're kind of stuck with him by default. Are you going to leave me? We have nowhere else to go. But I guess you have the words of life, but we're just really offended by them. Because when you tell a Jew about drinking blood, which is the most sacred thing on the planet for them because the whole law talks about the blood because it was all setting up for what was going to happen with blood. You tell a Jew to drink blood, you lost them. You took their most important sacred doctrine and trampled it on foot. And they're like offended by the words of Jesus because they were hearing his exegetical phrases, but they missed his heart. 
because God is relational, the word, ah, he has hidden his heart in the word and only those that see his heart will actually understand him and know him. Ah, help us, Lord. We're like, we're done, but I haven't even started, but it's okay. The greatest tool of condemnation and deception to believers is the letter of scripture. That's a tough statement. Because here's the thing. You can read scripture and hear the condemner. Or you can hear the Lord. The greatest tool that will lead you to him will, can also lead you away from him. If, if it wasn't, then the devil wouldn't have tried to use it on Adam and Eve in the beginning and on Jesus. The very thing that's supposed to give you life can actually kill. Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But it's from the same thing. Two things can happen. Life or death. From the exact same thing, it depends who you're listening to. Because you could be reading about like, you know, like, and Jesus, like, he would hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, they know what to do. And all of a sudden the devil's talking to you like, see, Jesus, he really was love. He could forgive, but you can't forgive your mom. Who are you? You're crap. <laughs> and you're reading about the love of Jesus, but you're being condemned because you're not there. And you're hearing the accuser instead of being like, no, Christ is in me. This is actually who I am. Like, whoa, I don't ever have to live in Sarks ever again. Like, wow, my mind's being renewed. Wow, Jesus, thank you so much. That actually, this is who I already am. Because you can either go into intimacy and, re and revelation, or you can go into condemnation. And it's all from the same source. So sometimes, like, I disciple people. Like, I haven't actually told this publicly. But, like, sometimes I disciple people. And, like, one of my friends that I was discipling, he was so full of, like, demonic principles in his mind, and he was tormented by actual demons and couldn't get deliverance that i was like every time he read the word it led him to suicidal thoughts and he wanted to kill himself because every time he would read it he would read how he didn't measure up to anything and he couldn't he couldn't live with himself i'm like bro in the name of jesus please put down the scripture and let's teach you how to actually know him and be a son because abraham who's the father of our faith how many texts of scripture did he have Think about that one. How much text did Abraham have who is the father of the faith? Literally no scripture was recorded yet. And, and he lived in a pagan land. And actually, if you read about the history and even look at some of the other books, apocryphal books, you can actually read about what Abraham was like. He was a pagan man that worshiped false gods until God revealed himself to him. He was not a God-fearing, Bible-reading man what's a bible he didn't have a bible he had the revelation of god and had communion with god and god he became such a close friend of god without a single text again guys please don't hear me say put the text down no 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 like this is this is a really quick way into knowing him but i'm just saying it's the voice that you're listening to and the heart that you open up yourself with. It's about opening your heart to the Lord, not to a textbook. It's about opening your heart to the Lord. So don't hear me put down the sacred scripture because Jesus had it memorized, but so did the devil. So it's not about the scripture, it's about the heart. The Pharisees had it memorized, but Abraham, God was so close with Abraham that God's like, Will I do anything without telling my friend? <laughs> I'm going to tell him what I'm going to do. He's my friend. And then Jesus is talking to the religious guys that literally have the whole entire text memorized. They haven't memorized where it is on the page. They studied it since they were kids. The most elite of the elite became Pharisees. And he tells them, your father's the devil. Our father's Abraham. No, no, if your father was Abraham, we were best friends. Then you'd be cool with me. No, if you're cool with Abraham, you're cool with me. But you're not cool with Abraham. Your father is the devil. What? No. They studied the text and taught the text to a whole nation and didn't know him. When he became flesh, they hated him and wanted to kill him. So clearly what they were reading was not him. It was through a skewed sarks of deception. And they got really religious, but they didn't know him. 
eternal life is that we would know Him. Yeah. Know Him, the Word. The Word that became flesh. To eat of Him. To partake of Him. Otherwise, there's no life in you. Life is what happens in your spirit, in your heart. It's not what happens in your mind and in your body. Jesus says in John 5, 39, He says to these super educated elites, you study the scriptures diligently. Thinking, thinking, which means it's not true. The in them is eternal life. John 5, 39. You study the text diligently. You memorized it. You teach it every single day. You go to the temple three times a day to worship and pray. You fast twice a week. Wow. I mean, let's talk about what their lifestyle was. Fasting twice a week, praying in the temple three times a day, memorizing the whole scripture, giving the whole life to the communication of scripture. And he says, you study it diligently, thinking that you got eternal life. But the script, these are the scriptures that point to me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying life is not in the text, it's in the word. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And manna is such an amazing symbol of that. Jesus is like, in Deuteronomy 8 verse 4, he says, when, I, when God, God says, when I fed you manna in Exodus 16, I didn't give it to you to feed you. I gave it to you to teach you. The man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I gave it to you to teach you, because where did manna come from? From heaven every day. And by 11 a.m., it was hot where it was no longer around. And it didn't matter how much you gathered, whether it was a little or a lot, whatever you gathered was enough because it was from heaven. So it didn't matter how much you ate, it's that you ate from heaven, not from earth. <laughs> It didn't matter if you gathered a lot or a little, and it was supernatural. And, it, and the next day, if you ate what came down from heaven yesterday, it killed you. Because now it's religion. Because it's not fresh. So yesterday's revelation, tomorrow is religion. And we live off of the conference that happened a year ago. We're like, man, God visited me in 1999. It's amazing. No wonder we're dead. We've been eating... On worms. We don't live by what came from his mouth. We eat of him. We, man shall live by every word proceeding. A present progressive tense. Man shall live by the words coming from the mouth of God. Not what came from the mouth of God. Now, we can hear what is coming from his mouth by what came from his mouth. But you can also hear the devil condemn you. By reading what came from his mouth. And that's what the devil used in Genesis. And that's what the devil used in Luke 4 with Jesus. He's relational. I'm going to end with this idea. Introduced a lot of ideas. Get into that hairy stuff and figure it all out. I'm going to let your pastor help you with that. Because he's an incredible teacher. Incredible. I just looked at his playlist on like two years of like teaching on grace I'm like Phew! like that revelation changed my life like when I started getting that a few years ago it was introduced to me by Dan Moeller and then just became this like Phew! wrecking ball I was like whoa it helped my evangelism it helped my love for my wife it helped my love for people it helped set me free like actually like look more like Jesus today than I ever have in my whole entire life I went from like a R religious, one to two hour a day praying, 30 minutes in tongues, you know, contending for heaven, tarrying until he comes, 10 day fasts, to like, whoa, he's in me, I'm in him, it's nonstop. I went from like an hour to two hours of, of trying to break down heavens to 24 hours of like, Because Paul says, pray without ceasing. And I was like, how do I go to bed, though? Like, do I stay up 24-7? <laughs> no, no, because clearly it can't be connected to what's happening in your soul or body. If you call prayer what happens in your soul or body, you missed it. Prayer is your communion by the Spirit, which can happen while you're sleeping. So when I started to learn how to receive revelation in my sleep, and I would wake up and be like, 
I think I can write a book. Like I remember everything the Lord downloaded to me. But I was like totally asleep. It wasn't like the restless kind of sleep where you feel like you didn't sleep. It was like, I feel like I slept 50 hours, but man, that was so rich. I ate all night. <laughs> because God will give to you even in your sleep. Oh, yeah. so good. Psalm 127, 1 and 2. It's, it's, it's in vain that you labor and toil and work really, really hard because God can give to you even in your sleep. Now, most translations butcher and say God will give his beloved sleep. But that phrase can be understood two ways. God will give to you even while you sleep. That's why the first two verses make sense. It's in vain while you labor because God can give to you anytime. Why do you work for it when God can give it to you? First seek him and all these things will be added so you don't have to work for it. We work for the things because we don't actually believe they'll be added. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't go to sleep because we need more hours to work more. And he's like, no, no, no. Go to sleep. I'll give it to you. Whatever you could have earned, it didn't matter if you picked a little or a lot. It was enough because it, where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. It's not about you gathered it here. It's the source of where it comes from. Because when it comes from heaven, phew, so good. Yeah. game over. So good. So are you feeding on heaven or are you feeding on knowledge? Because knowledge puffs up and kills. But love edifies. Love, heart, spirit. Jesus. Okay, I'll end with this idea. No more ideas, Vic. Stick to, stick to just a couple. You know, this is like the shotgun for like believing birds. You just throw out a billion BBs and just hope one of them hits, you know? <laughs> Shotgun for believing birds. Get one, you know? <laughs> Help us, Lord. It was always fascinating to me because, like, being a student of Scripture, I was always like, God, like, if you literally would have changed this, like, word to this, we wouldn't have, like, five denominations over this one passage. I'm like, God, why didn't you do that? Like, have you ever thought about, like, God, why don't you just simplify it and just say it how you wanted it so we wouldn't have to wonder? Anyone ever wonder that? Like, and then you're, like, trying to analyze all his parables. Like, what does that mean? I'm so glad the parable of the sower and the seed actually explains it because it's like we don't have to wonder about that one. But the rest of them, it's like, I wonder, <laughs> you know? But, and then the disciples were also wondering, like, Jesus, so, like, how come you speak in parables to people? And then what Jesus says is, like, very offensive. He's like, they're like, Jesus, like, can you just, because they're, they're, they, they don't get it. You talk about some sower, some seed. They're like, cool, we understand that. We just did that yesterday. Now, can you tell us what you're saying? We heard your words. Can you tell us what you're saying? And so they come to him, and he tells them what he said. But he's like, why don't you just tell everyone what you said? Why do you t talk in parables? He's like, oh, I talk in parables so that seeing, they don't see. Hearing, they don't hear so that their minds will be closed. Oh, so you tell stories not to like illustrate the point so it's easier to understand, but to like hide it? Uh-huh. Wow. We should try that in our teaching. Let's give illustrations that will totally mangle the idea. Because usually when we tell stories, it's to help the point be plain. But when Jesus told stories, it was to hide everything. That's what he said. Why do you speak in parables? So that they won't see, they won't hear, and so their minds will be closed. <laughs> That's pretty mean, Jesus. You're literally going to tell them a bunch of things, and you want them to not see or hear it or their minds be closed. And then he gives them the key. Yes. And he says, to you... It has been given to know everything. Why? Because they came to him relationally. And he's like, I'll tell you everything because you're my friends. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant, they just read, read, read like the eunuch that was there reading. Do you understand what you're reading? I don't understand anything. But then all of a sudden, Philip's like, let me open your eyes to him. And all of a sudden, oh, can I get baptized right now? Yeah. yeah. Because unless you come to him, it's sealed. Because God is so relational that if he would have put everything here, no one would ever come to him. Because all you have to do is come to the formula. If healing was a formula that could be written out, that we kind of make it formulaic, well, if you do A plus B, then C, God never works in formulas because he wants to be with you doing it. Yes. Uh -huh. 
because if he gave it all to you, you'd be like, sweet, I don't need you. I'm good. But he's like, no, no, no. Can, I, can we do it together? That's why he'll kind of throw it a little bit over here, a little bit over here, a little bit over here. And it's like, it's all contradicting. No, no, no. It's hidden because he hides his revelation inside of relationship. So he'll teach you everything. He said, no, 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 before it was closed, but now I'm going to tell you everything. The mysteries that were hidden from the foundation of the world are now going to be revealed, but only one way, relationally, instead of informationally. So you can go to Bible school all day long and never see him or know him. Because it's not done like this and like this. It's done like this. Jesus. So today, let me just bring it back to a very practical example, and we're going to end. I want to pray for you. This morning, just to make this so practical, many of you came into this service, and you were here, and you're just like, you know, the worship songs are going, and you're just like here. And for many of you, I'm going to guess, maybe not, I don't know, maybe I'll just talk about me. <laughs> It can become religious where you're like, I know I'm supposed to go to church. Oh, yeah, I know those songs. And like in, in our soul, we get into it in our body. And we get into it in our soul and we say the words. But we don't know how to actually open up our hearts so there's no communion. And then the problem with that is, is if you keep worshiping God in your body and soul and do that over and over and over again as a discipline, it will actually make your heart more coarse and coarse and coarse and there's no communion there. And all of a sudden you bought into a religion that actually has nothing in it. Because your communion with God is not what happened in your body or your soul. It's what happened in, Jesus, I want you. And then it was so cool to see Don just like, Jesus, I want you. And then I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And then just something shifted because it went from like songs, soul, gift to spirit. And that's what God's like, oh, worship in spirit and in truth. We live for connection, <laughs> not for activity, because the activity is called religion. And it's not a bad thing. You can consistently do the same thing over and over again. We call it you religiously do that. Cool. But the key is not in the activity. The key is in the connection. <laughs> so if you do the activity, but there's no connection... You just got religion. It's not about the activity of going to church, opening up your Bible, praying for an hour a day, praying in the spirit for 15 minutes before you go off to work. That's called activity. The key is not in the activity. The key is in the connection. So my, my goal every single time when I open this is like, Lord, I've been reading this thing for like 20 plus years. Like I'm not looking for information, although I really love new revelations. <laughs> But sometimes I worship a revelation more than I do him because I'm geared toward like unpacking more revelation. And sometimes I come to him because I want another revelation rather than I want him. It felt like almost coming to like a really wise person and you want to know what they know. Come for communion. Communion. Jesus, I just open up my heart to you. I don't have a relationship with my wife because I want revelations from her. Although I don't mind when I get them. But I come to her because I want communion. Because open hearts, open hearts. So when you came here today, and maybe you didn't have connection with the Lord, but you went through the activity, an hour of singing songs and moving your body. But there was no connection. Can I tell you, that we have to get past the sarks, past the soul, and get into the spirit. And when you live by the spirit, it's heaven on earth. In the spirit, there's no lack. So if you're focusing on the lack, then it's not in the spirit. There's no sickness in the spirit. There's no shame, condemnation. It's just him. Whatever is in God is in the spirit but we sometimes are so aware of everything else that we don't have communion and connection so I believe God's calling us back to like the most simple thing it's communion and connection he's relational I love that your pastor is so relational I want to be his best friend 
I, I, I barely know him. But I know him because I don't, I don't analyze him by the flesh, but by the spirit. And I'm just like, whoa, what a deep well. Like, I want these to be like, I want them to be my family. And I, I want to be family because I just see that there's a depth that God's doing here. But it's about opening our hearts. Amen? So, I just want to ask you a question. Help us, Lord. I'm so sorry. Man. I just want you to ask the Lord. Maybe it's today. Maybe it's just recently. But like, Jesus, what's preventing me from having that really deep connection with you? Jesus, what is it? Will you bring to my awareness? Even if it's in my subconscious. I ask you to bring it to my awareness so I can see that lie and reject it. <clears throat> what is the thing preventing me from connection with you? Because I want connection with you, but I feel like I want more, but I want something's in the way. Jesus. I allow you to bring up whatever it is that's keeping me from communion 